ਕਰਕੇ ਦੇਖਦਾ ਯੂਟਿਊਬ ਅੱਛਾ ਦੇਖੋ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ Hello, can you hear me?
हेलो हेलो आई सोना कैथरीन एंड आई आर जस्ट सेइंग हाय टू यू बट वी कैन हियर यू ओके आई एम अनम्यूटेड नाउ आई थिंक अनिता यू शुड बी एबल टू हियर मी यस आई कैन हियर यू वंडरफुल हे आई एम जस्ट गोइंग टू ट्राई माय स्क्रीन शेयर टू बी श्योर दैट आई एम एबल टू डू इट um yeah. let me do that okay <laughs> Give me one second. Yeah, they let it go through you. It's gone. <laughs> I was just uh, checking whether IIPS host can allow me to just test out my screen share. Um, we can take it. We can share it. Try to share it. Okay. Are you able to see my screen share? Yes, we are able to. See. Okay. All right. Then I'll stop sharing now. Okay. Hey, hi, Sundari. Hi, you muted, Sundari.
You know, the sound from IIPS is getting cut off, I think. Hello, Professor Sonalde. Hello, Dr. Lara Singh. How are you? How nice to I see you. I think you have to unmute. Yeah. I think I'm unmuted. You cannot hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sona. Oh, very good. Thank you. So, Anita, are you in Mumbai? I'm sorry, I didn't get to go to lunch with you and Catherine. Uh, where are you, though? Are you in Mumbai or Delhi? I'm in Mumbai right now, uh, and I'm going on a flight. I'm going back to the U.S. tonight. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I'm sorry I missed you. I will definitely come back. I'm going to bring Jay and the kids, too. So, I will see you next time. That sounds very good. Okay. I'm going to go sit down. Okay. Dr. Ladu Singh, are you able to hear me now? I also want to say hi to Professor Ladu Singh, but I don't think he hears us. Yeah. I could hear him a few minutes ago. Hello, Dr. Parsuraman. How are you? Amy. Amy, it must be very early for you. So <laughs> 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 Welcome on the distinguished guest. 
my dear colleagues, to Thank you so very much for the special application The audience therefore work. Thank 
Thank you, Professor Dennis, for giving such an introduction to I will make a small presentation on the software center. So I briefly talk about the center of demography of blender, who we are, and what we are doing. First, mission of the center. So I start with the mission of the center. And as you can see from the screen, we have six main objectives of the center. The first one and a very important one is promote high quality teaching and training on gender. We also aim to promote collaborative research on gender issues in population health and development in India and abroad. We also aim to provide timely input to various central state governments and local bodies on issues relevant to policies and programs. Another aim of the Center of Demography of Gender is to develop a network of researchers and professionals who are working on gender in India. That will give us a lot of opportunity to collaborate and to interact on topics that are of mutual interest. Another key objective of the center is to disseminate the gained knowledge among researchers. We all know that we collect a lot of data, including household survey data, good amount of information on gender, but at times this data doesn't reach to the people who want to realize it or people who are working in the field. So this is another objective where we would like to take this data to various stakeholders, disseminate the knowledge to them through various media, research articles, infographics, research briefs, webinars, etc. And finally, we also aim to create central data repository in India where anyone can come and collect the data on gender, whatever is available will be at one place, so that you come to that place and get whatever you want when it comes to gender. Then I have briefly listed the activities of the center, and these activities are very much aligned with the objectives of the center. So one very important activity is also to review the existing course curriculum on gender and develop model course curriculum. By that, we, we aim to strengthen the teaching of courses related to gender, not only at IUPS, but in other Indian universities and institutions. We want to conduct tailor-made courses on gender for working professionals, for researchers, and others who are interested in gender issues. We would also like to conduct analysis of existing data sets to address relevant policy challenges on gender. Promote collaborative research on less explored areas of gender. I have mentioned one of the objectives is to disseminate the knowledge, so that is an integral part of the activity of the center. We also plan to procure, collect, and compile data on gender and store it in a central data repository from where anyone and everyone can get the data free of cost and can use it for his or her own purpose. Then we would also like to train interns during summer or during when they are or for specialized gender data analysis or survey research. We would like to reach out to the central and state governments and local administrative bodies with policy relevant evidence. So these are some of the activities that the center has proposed to do in the next five years. In line with the activities and the objectives of the center, we have identified five research themes that we would like to pursue in the next five years. The first one is gender inequities. 
इस तरह के बारे में जेंडर एंड एक्सेस के रिसोर्सेस देन वी हैव रिसर्च टीम ऑन जेंडर एंड एक्सेस का पार्टिसिपेशन द फोर्थ थीम इज ऑन मेंस नॉलेज एटीट्यूड प्रैक्टिस एंड हेल्थ एंड फाइनली वी हैव अ टीम ऑन जेंडर एंड वर्किंग यू कैन आफ्टर सम टाइम यू विल कम टू नो दैट दीस फोर स्पीकर्स आर अलाइन टू वन ऑफ दी सो लाइक प्रोफेसर दिलमोटो विल स्पीक ऑन जेंडर इन इक्विटी and professor sona they said we'll talk about gender huh? professor tk sundri the women's knowledge masculinity and so on and finally professor will speak on gender based work so these are the four five dimensions that we have planned to work that way and who we are so as professor james has said there is a there is a group of people who are currently affiliated to the center so we are currently seven members one two and also we have a advisory board which consists of very notable people in the field of gender so people like nina agarwal who was also awarded padmashri by government of india for her work on gender equality is a part of the advisory board dr s c agarwal from iit bombay who Appears called as a bureaucrat to the government of India, but now a military fellow of the Institute of Technology, Mumbai, is on the board. Dr. Sonal Desai is on the board, and Dr. Chakravarti, few minutes back, has given introduction about her. We have Christopher Gulmoto on on the board. We have Dr. Pravindan Kaur from IIT, and Dr. Nita Raj from the University of California, San Diego. We have Dr. F. Ram, who is a fan. Director, Senior Professor of IIS, is on the board. Dr. T. K. Sundari Gavinder, and Professor Amy Choi. Amy Choi is Professor Emerita at Johns Hopkins University, West Bay, and we are privileged to have her on this seminar as on the first one. So this is the group of people who are actually guiding us through this process. With that, I have come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Over to you. Interesting, uh, Mr. Barber. Get his thoughts on the independence of the man. Congratulations. Thank you. That's a dream. Uh, other speakers, yes, students, faculty. First of all, congratulations on this seminar at the Center of Democracy. Uh, Professor James, thank you for explaining why it's demo. Activity. Uh, clearly, after listening to you, it's uh, obvious that the center has a very, very broad purpose. Very broad areas to look at. It needs to be inter interdisciplinary. Clearly, IIS has always been well known for setting the tradition for leading the higher branches. Indeed, this is the biggest project that has been expanded. So, again, congratulations for expanding into this area. Uh, it is promising to see how uh, we've been working in this area for four or five years in a very expanded way. And uh, this sector is supported by the health and health. That just shows the credibility and the potential it has to grow. Uh, it is also promising to see the potential of gender based violence, gender and social norms, the institution of the empowerment of the church. The Gates Foundation, we are Areas of the Clearly, a lot has happened in the past ten years. Many years we have been many seminars, many presentations. But more than that, the fact that we have got media attention, the fact that uh, policy makers have been interested in some stuff, all that goes to show the success even before the center has been established formally. So the That's why we we are continuing to continue partnering to take this 
to the next level. Uh, at the game foundation too, gender is an important area of focus for us. Uh, we believe that uh, without addressing gender inequality, there is no way we can address issues or the development of issues. And therefore, for the last 10 years, we have supported reaching out to the equipment gender. And now it's one of three key divisions. Uh, I'd like to perhaps uh, focus on one area before I decide about five broad areas of gender. Uh, the first is women's economic support. The second is women's education. The third is policy and identity. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about one area which is negative, but definitely all of this is data. That's why we feel uh, so I'll uh, give one example uh, on why data is very important. So clearly the first most important is the economic performance. And there we know that we have a number of participation in the foreign over the last 10 years. A lot of research has gone on, a lot of papers have been written. Yet, I still don't feel satisfied. Why it's gone down so much? So the theories are, you know, as income grows, some some women choose not to be in the labor force. That gives them a sense of data. So the data says that the percentage of women who are paid in or those who are some maybe the average is twenty six percent of women. So you see that the input of the facility from the that I understand. Fine, but you know, what I do goes with the charge. But you know, it doesn't fall. So that still doesn't give me a strong answer why the second people say that you know that it's a big shot because they have to go on. Uh, they are choosing to say that the most important thing is that perhaps look after kids. There's some value in looking after kids. Uh, and they are making the job and that's a rational thing. And that's a job and not all. But I think I'll be the same for any country in the world. Yeah. Faster than most countries in the world. We need five percent for the last 10 to 20 years, right? So then why do other countries also, the next, those countries that start? The work of participation is going down, but it's going down. So then you can put a lot of people like that are causing them. And then what I would really like to know, perhaps we define the water position of the market. The water is So clearly, if you go into any topic, I'm not talking about political problems. But there's just so much work to be done to really think yourself, this is what who are actually same labor force participation. And that's what really excites us about the center. So congratulations on uh, setting up the center and on the first and obviously seven first seminar of the center. Thank you very much. Again it's an honor to be part of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this next section is the per percentage. So I think we don't go perhaps go down because there are about PPT tests are there for us to be down. So the first one is by Dr. Christopher Gilmoto on that I have sex imbalance in India, which will be followed by and lastly by so each one has been given 10 minutes, but so they will have a lot of things to share. So I will be flexible about that. Over to you.
structure gives uh, one is compared to the ordinary case, you know, a case uh, where it is depict of getting, depict of get out. Uh, but now especially getting in uh, for certain part of the main population uh a serious gender. And of course, we know that accommodated a little bit by men, but in my very stable model, I do not even assume that women want to just for more information, uh, the same person has told me that half of the women are always in the end by what I'm going on. In Asia, compared to Sri Lanka, where a major case of men for women is around 24, and not to mention South Korea, Japan, where it's a young school. So, in terms of gender, is that the moment of transition? One is the wrong number, who are going to act on the kids, and the body. And this will take a bit of time than we can see. So, that we can just not even see data. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, would you also allow me to screen share, please? We will share from our side. Okay. So you can share. We will give you a Okay. Right. Um, I don't think I have the rights yet, but I clearly you can hear me, which is very good. Okay. Oh, give me one second. Okay, you should be seeing my PowerPoint screen. Um, let me just start out by thanking IIPS for this invitation and congratulating you on a wonderful effort. It's also really good for me to be speaking to demographers as a card carrying demographer, because you're actually going to hear from me a few complaints about the way demography as a discipline has incorporated um, uh, women's economic empowerment, particularly employment research in our own work. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to complain only about demographers. I also intend to complain about economists. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that historically, uh, gender has not been a disciplinary strength for demographers. In spite of the fact that we think of, uh, we have sex as a key demographic variable. Okay? We pay a lot of attention to measuring things like fertility preferences, contraception, uh, etc. 
But women's employment is something we saw historically as an independent variable. In recent studies, we have seen it as a dependent variable. But we have been really naive and assumed that employment measurement is the domain of economists and they know what they're doing. I personally would love it if they just came up with good measurement strategies um, and we can simply copy those questions in our work. Unfortunately, we can't. Let me give you an example. Okay. Um, National Sample Survey. Uh, you look, there, there are zillions of articles in newspapers in India about declining female labor force participation rates. Okay. National Sample Survey, uh, which we all think of as the gold standard, actually showed that between 2004 5 and 2011 12, female labor force participation rate. Uh, fell from 57% to 43%. Now, you know, and this is for women 25 to 64. For all women, it's uh, 33 to 24. This is a huge decline in a period of seven years. As demographers, we know that most of the women who are being surveyed in 2012 were alive and working or alive and in the sample in 2004-05. So this is a massive change for the same women over this particular time period, which is only a seven year time period. Okay. Can we really believe it? Historically, I used to think that, well, NSS is the gold standard. And of course, we have to believe whatever they say. Okay. Um, we have been doing some work using India Human Development Survey. And I was trying to compare the results we get with the NSS data. With all humility, I must tell you that I always treat what we do as something that is preliminary, experimental. Uh, NSS is the gold standard. If we don't approach it, then we must be doing something wrong. Over the years, I suddenly started realizing that I don't know that we were doing something wrong. Okay, Really, I think the problem was that what happened with NSS data was it was not that the wage work showed a big decline. It's the family based work, which is farming, working in family uh, farms, etc. decline from like 47% to 27%. Before I go forward, uh, let me just confirm that you can see my slides. Can you see it, Dr. Uh, uh, Singh? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, when we look at the same kind of uh, definition for IHDS data, we see some decline, but not a huge one. Okay, the kind of decline we see with uh, NSS sample was a really large one. So then I started wondering why is it that NSS shows such a big decline, uh, but the IHDS does not. Okay, and that kind of led us to do some sort of experimentation around the way in which um, employment questions um, are being asked in IHDS versus NSS, and can we find better ways of phrasing questions about uh, women's labor force participation? One of the problems that we all face is that feminist um, perspectives in some ways have been missing in the way the labor force surveys have been designed. Um, feminist scholars, particularly qualitative researchers, have long argued that the notion of economic activity is shaped by the way men work. Okay? Things that are called work for men are often seen as household chores for women. You know, there are things like people would say, oh, well, women raise chicken and they raise children, and these activities are often mixed up, and how are we going to tap it? Okay? Moreover, women themselves often classify themselves as housewives when they're actually engaged in substantial economic activity. I remember in my own work at one point in time, in, uh, interviewing a woman sitting in a shop. I'd been working in this village for quite a few days, and I had seen this woman working in the shop day after day after day. When we started, she became part of our sample. And when we interviewed her, she said, oh, I don't work. I just help my husband who owns the shop and he runs the shop. Well, what does the husband do? is actually a teacher somewhere far away, um, you know, and he only arrives in the shop in the evening to take a look at the accounts. Okay, But she didn't see herself as working and our um, statistics don't count her necessarily as working. 
So what happened with India is that we had tremendous feminist activism around measuring women's labor force participation in 1980s and 1990s. For example, Seva did quite a bit of work on capturing women in informal sector and CUS report focused on some of these issues. And we just, um, unfortunately, the, that work has kind of fizzled out and we haven't been paying sufficient attention to it in the recent years. So my thought was, okay, so how do we count these questions better? So we did a very interesting experiment um, in Delhi Metropolitan Area Study where we interviewed the same people in the beginning where we asked them the NSS style question. What was your primary um, activity status over the past 12 months? And for people who were involved in domestic duties, was there any other activity that you engaged in for a period of 30 days? This is exactly what NSS asked. Let me kind of go on to do the rest of the interview. And somewhere later on, we would ask them, okay, does your fa family have a farm? Yes. If so, who worked on this farm? Did you work on this farm? Um, do you own any livestock? Who takes care of the livestock? And so we are kind of guiding this conversation to the activities we think become part of the labor force rather than asking people, what did you do? And for the same people, what we find is very interesting. For women, the labor work participation rate using what we call activity listing increased from 27% to 37, 32%. And when we incorporated animal care, it actually rose to 38%. For men, interestingly, it declined uh, from 89% to 86% because often the head of the household was classified as the owner of the farm and he worked on the farm, but, um, but he never worked on the farm. Okay? <clears throat> So in some ways, for women, the labor force participation rose, for men, it declined very slightly. Okay? So I think taking into account the way women think, the way culture uh, constructs activities is very important for us to go forward if we are going to be sort of thinking about issues surrounding women's work. Now, how does it matter if we don't estimate women's employment accurately? Let me give you an example of how it matters. When research on pandemic um, and its impact on employment trend was coming up, immediately following lockdown, there was a strong concern that because of transportation restrictions and childcare responsibilities, women are going to withdraw from the labor force. And Indian newspapers were full of articles on it. Okay? Much of these arguments actually came from results based on CMI data, which is really not good at capturing women's labor force participation. It only counts 9% of the women is working, and most of those are in uh, urban formal sector. So it kind of warped our thinking in a very interesting way. Now, simultaneously, we were doing some of surveys in Delhi metropolitan areas where we had started in 2019, and we continued throughout the pandemic. We were doing monthly telephone surveys to find out what our respondents were doing using the state activity listing that I just described to you before. It was a four to five minute survey and it was done every month. What you see is the top line is the men, the bottom line is the women. You see this much larger drop during the first lockdown um, among men than among women. Uh, part of it is, was because, of course, that more men were employed, but it was not just that. Okay, Let me describe to you what happened in different sectors of work. Uh, when we looked at, look at the wage work, we actually see that, yes, it's true that the proportion of women who dropped out of wage work, and here the blue lines are uh, male participation rate, these are results from logistic regressions that control for a variety of background variables. The first bar is pre-COVID, the second bar is height of the first lockdown, third bar is sort of recovering during June to March of 21, then this is the delta wave April to June 21, and the final bar is July to September 21. And you see that both men and women experience a drop in employment. Women actually experience in relative terms a much sharper drop in wage employment. Okay. 
Uh, and so some of the arguments that we were making about women's loss of wage work were true. What we did not capture though, was that the impact on um, cultivation farmers was very little. Lockdowns didn't really affect farmers. Um, they also didn't affect people who were taking care of their animals based in their home and selling dairy product and some of the petty businesses. Okay, so what happened was that as long as women, uh, there was very comparatively lower decline in employment for both men and women, as long as they were in the farming. However, the compositional shift structure is such that um, 50% of the men are, were doing, in our sample, were doing wage work, 50% were doing um, self-employment, whereas for women, more than 80% were in the self-employment. So given that the composition of female employment was coming mainly from self-employment, the overall decline for women was smaller than the decline we see for the men, which as you can see here, there is a large sharp drop for men and somewhat lower drop for women. So self-employment actually protected women in some ways in this particular setup. However, it is also a double-edged sword because you're not making money. If you don't make money, then you don't have the um, bargaining power within the household and so on. But looking at more nuanced work on what men and women do and how it was affected by the, the pandemic uh, gives us a very different story than the kind of story that we get out of very straightforward, uh, the old labor force type surveys about what you are doing. So, what I would like to argue is that the way we conceive gender inequality shapes what we measure, but it's also true that what we measure also shapes our understanding of inequality. And I have to say, I'm quoting this, uh, borrowing this phrase from someone else's work, but it really spoke to me that, you know, measurement really does shape what we say at, uh, or understand about uh, issues that we care about. Um, so what next? Well, Nancy Riley once wrote this famous article of, uh, where she argued whether the feminist demography was an oxymoron. I hope not as a demographer and as a feminist, I hope it's not an oxymoron. But unless we can develop a better understanding of feminist scholarship and feminist activism, we will not be able to meet this challenge. Let me give you some examples. Uh, where are some potentials for synergy and research on women's work? Okay. I think feminist scholarship would argue that we have to go beyond add sex and stir approach that demographers have attended to take. Okay. So where, where, where might we go? Well, first area that feminist researchers have been emphasizing very strongly is intersectionality. And I have to tell you the demographers in the room, folks, intersectionality is not interactions okay this is something quite different we need to think about it very differently i think we tend to think that well we do a few fgds we put a few interaction terms it's going to sort of take care of the intersectionality of inequality between class race gender and various other factors that shape indian society it's also good for india that the intersectional research in the West has tended to move towards a strong postmodernist thrust, which is not the case in India. So I think that we can actually carve out a very interesting niche that can actually contribute to the global discourse rather than uh, just the Indian discourse. So let me give you some examples. Okay. I have uh, uh, I've done some work on um, women's work comparing Hindu and Muslim women. I also uh, the same paper. I also looked at some of the other forms of inequality by religion, and one of the things that we found was that there is a, that religious based inequalities are persistent in activities which are carried on outside the house. When it comes to what happens within the households, such as sex discrimination against daughters or um, intra-household bargaining, uh, Muslim women are no more disadvantaged than their Hindu sisters. But when it comes to employment, they are. And it, that kind of makes you wonder, 
So if it is not something within the household and the culture and uh, internal inequality, what is it about the social setup and the kind of employment that is available to buy to different religious groups that is shaping this particular pattern? This should be something we should be thinking about. Similar work around caste inequality, some very interesting work Matthew Ferry has done, uh, not around gender and caste, but mostly around caste. Uh, he has been looking at uh, political economy of caste in UP and finding that the areas in which caste inequalities are changing also creates a backlash which generates um, very different behavior among both Hindus and uh, upper caste and lower caste individuals. Okay, So for us to thoughtfully think about what intersectionality means would be useful. Same way, I think we might want to think about social reproduction. Now, this is something that is very normal for demographers to do. After all, we look at gender and family and marriage and um, Christoph uh, just made a wonderful presentation. But I think what would be very helpful for us is to move beyond uh, the individuals and households to look at the social institutions that create the burden of care work um, and a burden on women's time, such as investment in water, sanitation, school structures, zoning laws, and so on. The area in which I think we might want to overlap with feminist activism and use the activist insights to generate and define the agenda is so focuses around a variety of policy discourses. So, you know, one of the most interesting thing that is going on currently in labor statistics is the redefinition of what is defined as work. And there is a big advocacy within India that we should be adopting a global definition which was um, presented under ICLS-19, uh, which only includes work for profit or pay as a part of it work, its work. Is it really useful from an Indian feminist perspective to ignore um, work that is not part, uh, part of profit or pay? What are its gender implications? So I think that we should actually be talking to the policy makers, the statisticians, the redefinition of the statistical structure to see whether it makes any sense from a gender implications or not. Same way, I think there is tremendous amount of policy activism going on in India at this point in time around environment, infrastructure, social safety nets, um, social registries for welfare benefits. Again, how do we mainstream gender within those discourse? Okay, would be something that the uh, feminist activists are thinking about, and perhaps it's time for us as researchers also to think about it. So I would like to say that you know there are a couple of areas in which it would be time for us to be pushing the boundaries. I'd like to end with just one argument: data is power. And let's use it sensibly to reduce gender inequality. Uh, this is what demographers are good at. Um, it would be great to see more work coming out on this topic from all of us who are committed to this topic, including um, my colleagues at IIPS who have done taken a great initiative to set up this center on uh, demography of gender. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sonarde. I think that has been quite insightful how we really measure gender, especially gender work, and also what are the major issues which confront us once you look at the work participation as well as on other aspects of gender studies which we need to promote. I think this is really a serious issue which you have been discussing because many often it often comes to the forefront whether India there is a lot of activism which is happening both at the policy level as well as at the, the grassroots level. How do you measure it and how do you, whether Indian could measure it differently? Whether it is gender, whether it is nutrition, whether it is work participation, always this question comes, whether it is the right measure with the existing measures are right or Indian ethos are different, so we need to measure it slightly differently. I think that's perhaps something which all of us have to confront in the coming years. So it's good that you have pointed out that aspect as well. So let's move on to the next presentation. Next presentation is by Professor Anidhar Rant on gender-based violence in India, 
what do we know from the national data and what we have missing in our view interaction. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. I know it's warm and it's the end of the day. Um, first of all, I want to just thank you all for inviting me, particularly my colleague, Dr. James and Dr. Singh. Uh, it's an honor to get to be a part of this process, both as uh, an advisor and um, really a, a colleague in a lot of the work we're doing here in India with IIPS. And uh, I could, we couldn't be more pleased, um, our center couldn't be more pleased to have uh, the relationship with the DGA, the new center here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today, I'm going to go fairly quickly around gender-based violence in India. Uh, I'm going to use the NFHS 5 data and talk about um, what we know from the national data and what we're missing. So just a, a minute to reflect on the fact that gender-based violence, according to UN Women, it refers to the harmful acts directed an individual based on their gender. It's rooted in gender inequality, and it's an abuse of power and harmful norms. So this is sort of the, the way we approach the idea of gender-based violence. Oftentimes, we think about this as violence against women and girls, but it can include violence against men and boys, and it can include people who are not uh, within the binary. Um, however, much of our data it demonstrates that there is disproportionate burdens of certain forms of violence against women and girls, and I'll focus on those today. Those are also the two indicators that are used by the UN in tracking the SDGs and, and also what's getting tracked here, which is the proportion of partnered women and girls, 15 and older, that experience partner violence. Um, and it looks at the form of violence and the age at which it's occurring. The second is really about sexual violence, and, and to, uh, it, this is about non-partner violence, um, and it looks it's supposed to look at age and uh, place of occurrence, and you're going to see what we have and what we don't have. So many of you may be very familiar with the data from the NFHS-5. We know that when we look at the combination of experiences of physical, sexual, or emotional marital violence, that's what the MV stands for. Um, it's also called spousal violence in the NFHS report. About one in three ever married women have experienced this kind of violence in their relationship, 27% in the past year. If you go more narrowly to physical and sexual violence, because some people are concerned that the emotional violence measure is, is, is not always as clear for a lot of women, we still see that it is 29% ever. I think importantly, this is only a decline of about 2% since NFHS 4. So that's not much of a decline. We saw more of a decline um, from the NFHS 3. So that, but even that was still about a third. So we're really not seeing the rates of decline that we want to be seeing in India. 24% of the people of married women report that they had this violence in the last year. And of those reporting this violence, physical and sexual violence, one in four have experienced injury. If you look at the subsample who have experienced sexual marital violence, which the minority of those reporting marital violence, largely because we our measures are grossly inadequate with regard to the comprehensive measure of sexual marital violence, see that almost half of those reporting sexual marital violence have experienced injury. So some things that we want to understand is this is really limited to marital relationships, which is not supposed to be the limitation. That, that is it's supposed to be partnership. And as we see in India, a greater sense of partnership outside of the context of marriage, we know that we are grossly underestimating partner violence. 
And we already know that there is an underestimate because our, our uh, measures capture the, the tip of the iceberg, but particularly with regard to sexual violence. It's, uh, we know that from data that the, no the greater the number of items you have, the more likely you will get endorsement on any single item and experiences of violence. So I, I just kind of highlight for you that we look at this 32%, uh, but you can see a lot of variation by state with places like Karnataka, Karnataka and Bihar, where almost half of women who are married have experienced these kinds of violence. So what do we know about marital violence in India from these data? We know that attitudes accepting of, the, of marital violence is reported by about half of men and women. That's indicative of a norm. It's a norm of acceptability. We see some of the highest rates of acceptability in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, which corresponds with higher rates of reported violence. We also see that women's socioeconomic vulnerability is related to the higher instance of reported violence. Rural, more than urban women, women with no formal schooling versus women with, 20, with 12 or more years, women who are as, uh, scheduled caste tribe versus other caste, and strikingly look at the lowest quintile where one in three married women have experienced it versus the highest quintile where it's 16%. We also know that husbands controlling behavior and alcohol misuse is associated with this violence. We're more likely to see it when men are, in, are, are generally more controlling, which is not surprising because this is a uh, violence is a means of control of, of wives. And we also see that women are more likely to be afraid of their husbands. And we also see higher misuse of alcohol in the form of uh, drunken uh, activity. And finally, we see that the intergenerational aspects of marital violence persist. None, and so this, those who witness partner violence are more likely to experience it. This has not changed. We have not made any progress on this. Um, and so this is something that, yes, we know the drivers. Yes, we know the prevalence. And it is not changing. Well, what do we know about sexual violence? We know that about 6% of women report a history of sexual violence, that this is most likely to happen at a first occasion in adolescence and young adulthood, that it's most likely to be perpetrated by a spouse, indicating what the role of early marriage of girls can have in their lives, and secondarily by a boyfriend, which again indicates that we are not capturing the problematic experiences those in non-marital relationships are having and by denying this exists, we're missing the opportunities for support and, and intervention. Among never married women, what we find is that sexual violence is often from a relative or family friend. And I want you to hold on to that piece of information because we're going to talk about disclosure and you'll see um, some information that really questions how we're doing with, with uh, populations of unmarried girls who are, being, who are having these experiences. We see some of the same socioeconomic vulnerabilities, but one of the striking differences is what it means to have been married and report this. Why? Perhaps it is in part because you are more comfortable reporting the behavior when the spouse is no longer in your life. It is very difficult to identify sexual relations in marriage that are coercive and abusive as violent for married women. So we know that there's data availability and quality concerns. Our SDG indicator says it's supposed to include location. We have no information on location, largely because in the context of India, we have assumed that this is happening in marriages or in households. But these things do happen outside, and they especially happen when you start to include in sexual violence issues that we may describe as harassment in the workplace and public spaces. We know that non-partner sexual violence is not easily disentangled. And again, we know that underreporting is a serious concern, especially for non-marital violence. So in this way, we've been working as a team with IAPS and what is now CDG to start applying novel methods to, to, to discerning what the experiences of non-marital sexual violence are. That sometimes when you have low reporting, you have to enhance your analytics to have a better understanding of the issues. You can see that even with these under reports, and this is from the MNHS4, you're talking about 4.4 lack of girls and 1.4 million women. And most of them tell no one. We've also done machine learning. And what we found with machine learning is probably that the most, the, the most uh, correlated data 
is that you've experienced other forms of family violence. So this is sexual violence is something that happens in a broader array of violence that women experience and girls experience. And with regard to freedom of movement, when there is more freedom of movement, especially for girls, there is more violence. Is the solution that we are going to tell girls to stay home and stop their mobility? Are we gonna make the necessary social changes to allow freedom of movement for women and girls? When you look at the data from NFHS 5 on reporting, you see that 77% never disclosed this marital violence or sexual violence to anyone. This was high, higher when the perpetrator was a family member and even higher when it was someone that was neither family nor partner. 86% of women reporting this violence, even if they disclosed, 86% never sought any help. And when disclosure or help seeking happened, it was typically to, by turning to a family and secondarily a friend. Our formal services are not working. And I say are, I am an American citizen, but I very much feel attached to India, it's my heritage. Um, only 6% reported to police, this is very low, but this is up from 1.2% seen from the prior round of the survey. So when we try to understand this, it's important because we know there's underreporting to try to triangulate our understanding in, uh, with perspective on other data. We know from the crime in India data that there was an increased reporting subsequent to the Delhi Narbaya case because at that point there was a lot more, there was a destigmatization to some degree and a greater awareness of um, police engagement. But what we did find from these data is that women police, uh, police stations did not make a difference. So some of the ideas we have for policy, our data are indicating these are not the right tracks for what we need to do. We also have looked at online misogyny because we know that there's a social context. And with regard to online misogyny, and I bring this up not just because it's an, an indicator of, of what is other data we can use to understand the issues, but because these, for this particular analysis highlights what happened in the COVID lockdown. And you can see a dramatic jump in the online massage that was subsequent to, um, to the COVID lockdown in spring of 2020. So we don't know, there's a lot of people who say that there was an increase in IPV. We don't know that that's the case, but we do know that negative and hate speech generally went up and that include misogynist tweeting. And that brings me to, the primary concern that we need to have. We have a number of gaps. We know that IPV is related to, to increased risk for maternal and child health concerns. We know that it's affecting contraceptive use. It affects reproductive coercion. We know that sexual assault and, and marital violence increase our risk for injury. We know that it affects women's participation in the workplace. But we don't even have data at a national scale on sexual harassment, sexual harassment in the workplace, sexual harassment using digital technologies. Digital technology use went up over COVID. If you want to tell me that when increased use went up, cybersexual harassment didn't go up, there is no way. We know cybersexual harassment went up intuitively. We have no data and analytics to support it. But I can tell you in the context of the US, the mental health effects of the pandemic were exacerbated by the, for those who experienced this kind of cyber sexual harassment increase. And it's probably the same in India, and we don't have the data we need. We need to understand how harassment, and, and that includes violations, physical violations of uh, sexual spaces are occurring in public spaces and transport. We need to understand sexual exploitation and quid pro quo sex. There's a variety of sexually abusive behaviors that we are not tracking, um, stalking, bystander behavior, when people see it, what do they do? What do they say? Are we altering the norms to affect the change in our society? Because if we're not, we can talk all we want about getting women into a workplace, but why would you go? Why would you send your adolescent girl for greater school opportunities if you did not feel they could be safe? We know that that harms, and we know that there are norms that affect it, but we do not actually have the numbers and the data on the norms. We have no data on the violence 
against our sexual and gender minority communities. And we know that it's worse. We don't even have solid crime data on it. So these are all things we are working to achieve in partnership with CDG. We're undertaking some early uh, research now to start to pilot some measures and see if we can go to scale. We've also been involved uh, in collaboration to help think about some of these issues in the next round of the NFHS. Um, I close by saying we don't know a lot. We need to learn more. But the opportunity is great because we are developing the measures and we have the surveys. India has some of the best demographic statistical analysis in the world. The opportunity, if we get the measures in place and collaborate, can not only improve the situation in India, it can have global impact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, at the beginning note. What we really don't know about the, the violence, indeed it is true. These are the estimates from NFHS itself. So much of variation from one round to another round with some of the states really tells that what is really happening in the area of violence, how widespread it is, and also how far are we are missing capturing intensity of the violence. And also giving an uh, overview of what we can really do in the coming years in the area of the violence. Thank you for that. Uh, we will call to the last presentation by Professor T.K. Sindhari Devindran on men, masculinity, and health through a gender lens. Over to you, Sindhari. Thank you. Is it audible, Professor Sindhari? One minute, we are going to rectify the issue. Yeah, you are now unmuted. You, perhaps it is audible for you right now. Yes, yes it is. So uh, good evening, everyone. And I hope my slides will be put up now uh, and I can get started. Yes, yes. Uh, just a minute, we will share your slides. Yep. So, thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk on a very often never discussed uh, issue. Uh, I must confess that I am not an expert on this topic, but surely have a perspective on this. And I did not want to let go of the opportunity to present that to all of you. So this talk is about men, masculinities and health. Focus on men's health, although it has an impact on women's health. Next, please. So I'm focusing on three aspects. I start with looking at why gender matters for men's health, uh, not only women's health, and then go into masculinities and men's health in India. What do we know? We know very little, in fact, and some thoughts on what can be done. Next, please. So I'm presenting, I hope, I don't know how clear this is, this is a uh, conceptual framework, an excellent one by Hazy et al. published in The Lancet 2019, which brings together some of the latest thinking on the ways in which gender impacts health. So infants are born with certain biological endowments, male, female, intersex, but then they grow up gendered as male and female in a society. Uh, and there are gendered systems, as you see down there, such as uh, the family, the community, the various institutions, uh, including schools, health systems, and even policies that 
shape the way a male has to behave and the way a female has to behave. And in gender analysis in health, we normally uh, go by four uh, characteristics. One is the gender norms, which dictate what is the right way of being male and female in a given time in a particular society. The gender norms influence gender-based division of labor, what is appropriate work for men, what is appropriate work for women, and in turn, they also influence access to resources and to decision-making power. The next part is that gender interacts with other axes of power, like class, caste, ability, um, you know, and sexual orientation, and so on, to create particular social positions. So you can be not all, the, the point of this is that not all men are homogenous, nor are all women, nor non-gender binary uh, persons. They are not all equal, they are stratified according to various axes of power. And together, these lead to pathways such as there is a unequal uh, exposure uh, to uh, health risks and uh, then differential uh, vulnerability, differential access to health services and to differential health and social consequences resulting in health inequalities. So gender norms are shaping how men and women behave also the exposure to risks. So it's not only all behavioral, it is about where they are located, who they interact with. This differs by whether you are male or female. And this uh, um, framework is quite complex. It has structural and other determinants of health. And on the top, an embodiment over a life force at the bottom, both of which uh, are important in uh, deciphering, in, in uh, determining the health outcomes. Now, my focus is going to be on the gender norms that define what male behavior or appropriate male behavior is, which is called masculinities. Next, please. So what, uh, there are many, many defini definitions of masculinities. And I'm giving one that uh, is uh, somewhat recent. So it's a set of rules and expected behaviors that is associated with men and manhood in a given culture. And it emphasizes certain expressions of masculinity. And it enforces dominance, power, and privilege of certain men over women as well as over certain other men. So here it already uh, takes into account the heterogeneity in power within the group of men. The expression also refers to versions of manhood that enjoy greater power than other. That is subaltern, what is known as subaltern masculinities, men belonging to lower income groups or racial ethnic minorities, more vulnerable, marginalized uh, groups. So the point is that uh, there are multiple masculinities. These masculinities dictate how men have to, what is appropriate for men to behave like in a given time, in a given society. Does not mean all men conform to it, or but men who may not conform to it are also facing challenges and dominance as much as, or maybe, you know, nobody has looked into this as women do. And I'm now going on to look at a framework that examines how masculinities uh, affect men's health. Next slide, please. Oh, this is really tiny, huh? So masculinities, this is a framework by Regonese et al, which has on one side masculine norms and connects it to risk behaviors, 
and then to the leading causes of mortality and morbidity, according to the global burden of uh, disease. And their list of masculine norms is not always followed by everybody, but it includes self-sufficiency and emotional uh, control, uh, acting tough and risk-taking, being physically strong, attractive, rigid gender roles, that is very traditional thinking about what men should do and what women should do, and that men are superior and that they ha should have sexual prowess and power, aggression, and control. And really, you know, there are masculinities do differ across cultures, so protection and the responsibility for taking care and ensuring that uh, your community and your family are uh, protected and do not face risks and threats also is defined as part of masculine norms. This is one set of norms that have been used by this group for studying the impact of masculine norms on risk behavior. On the other side is your list of leading causes of global mortality in men, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diarrhea, chronic, etc. And the connection between the risk behaviors such as tobacco use, alcohol use, drug use, uh, occupational hazards, and poor diet, and uh, limited health seeking. This relationship between the middle and the right has been established. There is empty, you know, ample evidence of this. What their study does is to establish the connections. Uh, they have collated available evidence to show that many of these behaviors uh, that are considered as uh, the epitome of masculinity actually uh, lead to higher risks. And it's not just risk behaviors. It puts men at higher risk in certain uh, ways. Uh, for example, the kind of work they do and the locations in which they work, but also encourages uh, risky behavior, which then leads to uh, the um, health negative health outcomes. This is not to say that there are not positive masculine traits. We are focusing here on what needs interventions and changes. Next slide. So we see uh, one uh, piece of evidence that I was able to see in addition to uh, the study is from the global burden of disease, you do see uh, how the male risk for particular uh, risk factors is so much higher than female risk, except for unsafe sex, where male risk taking actually results in female vulnerability, not vice versa. Next slide. So what do we know? What do we know about uh, the Indian situation? And I looked uh, hard uh, and long, and I was able to find some information separate on what are masculine norms and some on uh, what are the leading causes of mortality and morbidity in men and how some of these are higher for men than for women. Uh, but uh, I must say that uh, a lot of studies have been done in India about masculine norms and gender-based violence, and also how masculine norms affect women's health. But the connection to men's health is uh, yet to be directly studied. So there are two studies here, all from mid-2014, uh, 2015, etc. And this is what the men, uh, urban professional men had to say about what do they consider masculinity, is being head of the family, being independent, being in control of one's emotions, being able to take care, you know, solve problems without seeking help from others. While times are changing and urban professional men were accepting of women's advancement, uh, they were still resistant to having partners who earned more, or were more successful, and their expectations in marriage and household were 
male centric and male focused. They still uh, looked for a supportive and uh, you know wife who facilitated and the male carriers and so on did take precedence over women's. This is a very well known study by ICRW, uh, which actually looked at masculinities and sun preference and gender based violence. And they looked at masculinities uh, in terms of not only, uh, you know, their recognitions of how they exercise control, uh, how they had gender inequitable attitudes, but how also masculinity meant additional or uh, enhanced economic stress, and also that they had grown up uh, with uh, discrimination or harassment as a norm in their households. So this is what they knew about the uh, relationships between men and women. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of linking it to uh, men's health, as I said, no direct links, no studies looking directly at that. But we do know that many of the global fat patterns uh, are repeated uh, in India, uh, with you know non-communicable disease risk factors being elevated, and showing up in a higher uh, you know being these uh, being the top uh, ranking uh, causes of death, death uh, from road traffic injuries, uh, and uh, prevalence of communicable diseases, occupational health hazards, and suicide. Uh, um, rates again higher for men now across India in different states age specific suicide rates do vary and there are states where in particular age groups women very unusually for global trend uh, do have higher suicide death rates but overall what this shows is that the exercise of masculinity uh, or, you know, living up to masculine norms is not changing very much uh, in India. And it is affecting probably, we don't, we haven't uh, seen any direct uh, connection being made, but we need to do that. And I hope the center will be among the first to start working on that. Next. And what about health-seeking behavior among men? Now, globally, uh, it has been established that men, uh, see, you know, their health-seeking is lower. They go later. They are more, uh, you know, unlikely to seek help because of uh, notions of being strong and not complaining, being able to bear pain, and so on. But studies in India uh, show particular uh, areas where men's uh, help seeking is very poor, but whereas in other areas, it is different and not necessarily lower. So uh, there's a study from Urban Slum in Kolkata that found that men preferred modern therapies that yielded quick outcomes and they felt that it was because they were bread earners and they had to immediately get uh, well that they uh, resorted to very quick you know solutions to their health problems but more uh, informal writing in newspapers and blogs where men have shared how stigmatized it was to seek help for mental distress to seek counseling, therapy, or mental health care because real men wouldn't do it. This has been reported more by from personal experience in blogs and in kind of uh, journalistic uh, reporting. Of course, I don't have to tell a group of demographers about men's health seeking behavior when it comes to contraception is abysmally poor. It hasn't improved all that much, uh, even though condom use seems to have gone up uh, in uh, the latest round of NFHS. The uh, use of male sterilization still remains very, very low. And men uh, have been reported by many studies to consider contraception 
really women's business. And in recent studies that I had done in Kerala, I found this to be true, both among very young men who had been recently married and among older men. So it was not a male only study, but women and husbands. And uh, they were very happy that they had allowed their wives to practice con contraception, not always, but as they found appropriate. Next slide. So what, is, what does this mean, uh, really? One, as I already mentioned, for a research uh, uh, center such as yours, I think a research agenda to look at diverse masculinities and how they affect attitudes, health-seeking behavior for themselves, for their households, and especially for the women of their households uh, is very, very important. We need to, you know, please, previous slide. So we have to start with the recognition of the negative impact of many traditional male gender norms on men's health and on women's health in government policies and programs and in research. We need policies that do not reinforce male superiority and traditional male and female uh, gender norms. And we know that many uh, health programs even the NCD prevention programs and so on, although they keep talking about risk factors such as drug use and alcohol use and so on, uh, have never recognized it as a larger than individual behavioral issue uh, where you, know, you talk to individuals and try to convince them. It's not going to work because it's part of a gender system and unless mindsets changed about what masculinity and desirable masculinity was about, this uh, could not, uh, this will not uh, change. And lastly, I want to say, and I think Sonal had also talked about, uh, you know, the, uh, how uh, work advocacy in India is happening. That is happening in the NGO sector also about masculinity. There have been uh, interventions uh, by the Center for Health and Social Justice, for example, which is about uh, Zimedar Pita campaign, Samajdar Jodidar campaign, all directly, uh, you know, um, addressing the issue of negative masculinities and trying to change it and to kind of harness the positive masculine traits to better health of men and uh, their households. There is also, you know, there is uh, one of the most important things is to start very early. And there was a very interesting intervention by ICRW, I think, about gender equality uh, movement in schools, which was implemented uh, in uh, Mumbai, where, uh, you know, boys and girls were exposed to gender equal norms and you know it was a curriculum they had to and they also were given an opportunity to discuss and reflect over how uh, they behaved as boys and girls and uh, this has been evaluated and found to have made uh, quite an important uh, difference and there is also a program called parivartan which used sports to mobilize young men and women to change gender norms so what uh, I would like to end with is to say that we have to start addressing masculinity as an important uh, negative masculinities as an important uh, variable that affects fertility behavior, that affects health seeking behavior. And unless that is addressed and that is recognized as more than an individual uh, issue, we uh, will not be able to make an impact on the gender-based violence that people were talking about and on other negative uh, you know, in consequences of gender inequalities. Thank you. Thank you. I think what a perfect end to this panel of talk starting with Day, whether it will be women and then ending how actually we need to concentrate on men really if you are looking for a gender equal world. Thank you, Professor Sindri, for that inciting talk.
we don't have much time left, but still we need to have some discussion on the co-presentation which we have heard. So I am afraid there is some issues with the voice because there are some complaints that the voice is not very audible to the online participants. So those who want to ask questions are better that you come here and ask questions so that it will be audible to them. So this is open for questions, comments, and suggestions. Unfortunately, you may have to come here and ask questions so that it will be audible to the online participants. Okay, so okay. Good evening to all of you. And it is nice and listening to all distinguished scholars. It also gives me a sense of pleasure uh, looking at the nomination of demography of gender because I was also part of the experiment. James has told that we have a lot of discussion and there was no dispute on this center. Precisely due to uh, the fact that gender is very important and demography as such is a very interesting subject as it has emerged. And when we look at demography uh, from the perspective where demography deals with life, death, marriage, sex, reproduction, and where, where we live and work. So it, it is very interesting and I think that this may be the first center in India, and I don't know whether it is the first center in the world. So I congratulate uh, the team and IITS director uh, for this center. I also feel that demography is centering or this uh, concern of demography, embeddedness of the gender within demography is very important. And in that respect, we have fertility, we have mortality, we have migration also. Mainstreaming migration is also very, very important so that we can see gender, how gender relations are, uh, are changing and that component is very, it has very strong interface and there is a difference between migration and migrant, I do not want to go into it, it is limited, but we see that within demography, we have a lot to share with other disciplines. Till now we have been borrowing theory from other disciplines. Now we can also contribute, but that requires certain methodological uh, innovations and challenges, etc. Lastly, I see that there is a wind of change, social change, and uh, social transformation centering around gender. This will be, I think, biggest revolution in, in coming decades where gender equity is not something about health issue. It is uh, not about economic issue, saving the political and economic system, social system of the country, where the caste prejudices will be eroded through this movement, as well as religious fanaticism. So I see great hope, great imagination, and its embeddedness in wider, wider social political system of India, and the transformation. With this, I think I congratulate again, and my good wishes to the department. Thank you, Professor James. I, I think I have relevant one or two queries, not any lecture here. Now, what I would say sometimes demographers also become lazy. Uh, the reason was that, you know, in NFHS uh, file, when it was being collected, the law came that you cannot collect data from sexual violence and domestic violence from women under 18, as per the law. Now, as a researcher, I think it is also our responsibility to write it into this newspaper and media that at least there are certain exceptions should be there. Because if you do not have data of women under 18, you can never, uh, you know, you can never see what is happening, even any statistical model. Reason is that when women, you know, when aged marriages so low, all these micro level variable changes. Okay. So you have a big limitation of this, uh, you know, in the NFHS. And I told Shirin Jijabai that you need to write this because you are out of the government system. That researchers should not be barred to collect data uh, on women under 18. That is one. Second is, uh, my question is basically, 
uh, Gulnoto, that you got very nicely smooth man women graph. Are they really so nice? I would like to really see because I was also trying to estimate, but they were very nice. Either you have smooth them very nicely going, there's a parallel line man women. If that is so, then you know, sometimes this uh, social and economic uh, uh, dynamics of marriage itself explains something. So I need to know a little more about that. Uh, thing. The third one, which I see that marriage itself is why, I mean, we need to know that why marriage culture is imposed. If somebody doesn't want to marry, let not them marry, let remain unmarried. So marriage is so much preoccupied by marriage. Companion, companionship is fine. Because you need and you know there's a loneliness, then the all health related. Why marriage is so much bothered? Whether it is culture, if you say culture, if you go 200 years before, culture was different. If you go 3,000 years before, culture was different. So we need to understand that why we should preoccupy by this. So this, this, these are two queries uh, we need to think. And that that final thing which I would say, say are the center and those who are working. Nowadays, there are a lot of literature showing that you, we need, we demographers generally need, generally analyze data on micro level. Now, micro, macro uh, understanding is increasing, but there is, you know, where demographer have a age is called meso. You need to understand how cohort analysis to be seen. There's not many people doing that. And that is an expertise where demographer have an age. And mac macro analysis changes that, the definition of that, you know, culture to culture change. And therefore, this center should tell in Indian context that this is the macro level variable which better fit to India compared to the international standard. So that's why we need to understand these three uh, different level of analysis. And somewhere we need to define that this micro, meso, and macro level variables, these are the variables. At least you must have preliminary variables. Once you do an analysis, we cannot fix them, but there are certain set of variables that demographers have to actually, uh, you know, decide. And I, I would still see that, which is there is an expertise in understanding uh, meso, but we generally do not have those in analysis nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, please. Myself, uh, is Lagin. I am a retired professor from this institute. So, uh, I am retired in 2011 and I have worked in this institute for about four decades. And since I start working, I hear the same story that <laughs> There is a uh, discrimination of, against women, all sorts of things are coming, coming one another. But although I appreciate for the Center for Demography and other, uh, their own institute, I glad, and, but we should look into why this variation instead of uh, Analyzing the same thing that there is a discrimination and violence, but all these things. But we we think there is no discrimination among men. That is also not true. That that type of analysis is not being done. And it, uh, I found in my family itself, I feel I am proud of saying that women are more stronger than men in their appearance. This is, I am talking about a very biased sample, but may be true in various uh, families, particular uh, urban areas. But in the rural areas also, we should analyze in a different manner, not that we should they are discriminated. Why they are discriminated? What is the reason? Are there any situations where men are discriminated against women and why? But this type of analysis we never do because this uh, demographer themselves has a 
discrimination based. Discrimination among themselves. That is the main problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think we don't have much time now because we have also an advisory committee meeting now. Maybe another one question in case of uh, anything. Okay, start off. That will be the last question. Well, the students are raising time, so I should give at least one chance to the students. Okay, next to 12 and then yes. In explanation to what you mentioned, if you have conspired to the I also see that you are a strategic model of the region. 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 Second thing, we are thinking that our ethnic system and factor will be seen and fit for you. So we are confronting our do we not think that when we over the time? It's true, do we have to have this in terms of obtaining the short shortage? You know, that is so I think it's a question in your analysis of the future. Then coming to the Okay, thank you. I see one student is raising hands, so there was no other students raised their hands. So I will give that opportunity to the student, and that will be the last question. Good evening, everybody. My name is Krishna, and I'm here to show my energy. I would like to actually when uh, 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 different talking about gender, uh, where. Uh, Yeah, please. Can say one thing. And, uh, yeah. That's kind of very Oh, 
I am not very sure how far to go to them. So I just want to comment on moving beyond the binary and also um, including, you know, input so, so sexual preference, like what you know who your sexual partner might be, the gender. We do work in California, and as you can appreciate, within the context of the United States, California is a place where we have more people who do identify beyond uh, traditional male and female categorization. The struggle is, and I, I think we have to give space for self-identification, there's no question. The struggle is with quantitative analysis, having the numbers we need to make the analysis. And, one of our great frustrations is, is that people are always asking us about that with our state level data, and we just don't have the numbers. So it's, I, I both agree, and I think you have to really both have questions that help people be able to identify more broadly, but also have sufficient numbers, and that can be really hard. Thank you. Because you had the maximum questions. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thanks for, for, for your comments. And uh, of course, I fully agree that what I've presented here, I, I could have given more details, but uh, Abhishek gave me 10, 12 minutes. <laughs> so I have to skip some of the nice, exciting, uh, the novelty details, including how I did uh, smooth. Uh, some of the age uh, uh, specific rates. And otherwise, yes, there, there is an open question about gender norm related to marriage. And this is part of the future of uh, research in the way that uh, Professor Sundari already uh, uh, highlighted. So, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, very interesting personality, would you like to come in? I have got it so even for you. I am not finding any response. I don't know whether it is not audible or whether it is because they don't have any response. Thank you so much. I think this has been an exciting evening. Perhaps I think we learned several things. It is as I think was Christopher has clearly told, you know, the purpose was to really look at the intensive what kind of analysis, what kind of adjustment they made, that wasn't the purpose. But, you know, even in the classic three cases which they have presented, whether it is sex ratio, which is perhaps in India starting from Visaria's classic work and birth answer reports work, which is starting from, even then we don't have several issues unanswered. That is what actually a center for demography of gender should continue. I think that is also the case with the classic case of the, the labor force participation of women, which is decadal de debates are existing in India, but we still don't know how to even measure it correctly. That is what the message Sonali Desai is giving. Where actually, as a demographic community, there is a lot to contribute. This is also the same case with violence against women, and which is, has been discussed, discussed now on several rounds of NFHS gives you that data. And plus, there are different NGOs conduct very micro level studies, which give you much more intense information as well as on the high intensity of the violence in this country. But but she has brought out clearly what is really missing on our understanding. I think that was perhaps the purpose of this paper. And the most importantly, Dr. Sundari Devendra has entered into an area where we don't have any understanding at all. Actually, hardly any data exists in understanding what masculinity, what is impact on health, how it affects on the women, and so on and so forth. So that way, it really opens up a Pandora post to in front of this Center for Demography of Gender. What is the direction in which you need to really take up our research and our teaching in the coming years? That has been a good beginning. Thank you so much for the all the four speakers and also for uh, participation from the Gates Foundation. As I didn't really announce it because Gates has almost, we can say, has communicated us that they will be ready to fund this center for the next coming years. So we are really happy that Gates Foundation has come out with a token. So thank you so much for your participation. So because everything has to have an end, so this important event also we have to end. Before we end, let me invite uh, Dr. Suresh Jungari for a formal vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Paul.
It's uh, I feel honored and privileged to be get this opportunity to talk about what I can on the occasion of this inaugural seminar of the Center of Democracy. I would like to thank all the speakers who blessed us with us for today's program. On behalf of the CDG, I convey a deep regards and hearty thanks to Professor Kishto Bikurmoto for coming in person and giving a fascinating speech on new data about sex imbalance in India. So it was a really a thought provoking speech. I also pay my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Sonal Desai, NCAR, New Delhi, and University of Delhi for accepting our invitation and attending the inaugural seminar online and providing important insights on incorporating women economic participation in demographic research. My words are not enough to express my gratitude to Professor Anita Ra, UC San Diego, USA, who graced us for this inaugural seminar and provided the impetus and thought about remarks on gender-based violence in India. What do we know from the national data and what are the missing? So thank you so much, ma'am, for coming here and giving your time. I pay my gratitude and thanks to Professor T. K. Sundari Ravindran for agreeing to participate virtually and providing our valuable perspectives on men and masculinities as well through the gender difference. I also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Alkesh Madhwani, Director BMDF Poverty Elevation Program, for uh, giving a congr uh, congratulatory remarks. Thank you so much for coming here. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of our CDG, convey my deep regards and thanks to Professor J.K. James, Director and Senior Professor IAPS, for the continuous support and guidance from the beginning of the center and also successfully conducting this particular seminar. I would like to thank Professor Abhishek Singh, Head and Aprajita, Professor Aprajita Chattopa, the Associate Head, for their keen interest in pursuing the CDG's activities and making this inaugural seminar a success one. I would like to thank and acknowledge the Gender Project for their financial support and logistic support for successful completion of this uh, seminar. I would like to again thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Mr. Prashant Borde, Chief Administrative Officer come Registrar, and entire establishment section for their support and making all suitable arrangements for the conducting this seminar. I extend my gratitude to all invited guests from various organizations who graced us for this particular event. I'm also very much thankful to all our current and former faculty members of the Institute, non-teaching staff members, research scholars, and students for their active participation in the seminar. I hope this seminar, this inaugural seminar, will, will raise a lot of questions, just given us a lot to think and take ahead. I hope that we will receive a similar kind of response in the future activities of CDG. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you all. And this seminar is closed. And thank you for all your participation. And those who are attending the, uh, the advisory board meeting, there will be another link which I have been shared with you. You may join there. We will start the meeting within 10 minutes. So it is already 6 10 India time. So 6 20 India time, we will start the meeting. Thank you so much. Oh, oh no, it's great. No, I'm super happy. I, I'm so thrilled about that. <laughs> ठीक है मिल जाएगा मिल जाएगा
अरे हम लोग कितने पर जेंडर सालों से पढ़ा रहे हैं